All right. So I'm Adam Farquhar. Um, I'm head of digital scholarship at the British Library. Um, it's lovely to be here today, and it's lovely to see um, so many uh, uh, friends and colleagues from uh, uh, across the, the years, actually, um, in the room. <clears throat> So as head of digital scholarship, sort of my main role is to get our digital content at the British Library in the hands of researchers and scholars so they can do something cool, um, interesting in it, so they can create new knowledge. Um, British Library, many of you will know, um, we sometimes have a slide like this. Uh, remember this number, 150 million items. Um, it's a substantial uh, collection. This is our, our print, our physical uh, materials. Um, over the um, last years, though, um, we've been increasingly collecting digital content. Uh, this is a, a graph of um, growth in the digital content collection. Um, this has really taken off also in the last year, about just about 12 months ago, um, within the UK. Uh, the, the, legis the regulations that we've been waiting pretty much a decade on came into force and legal deposit was extended to include non-print material, so digital material. So over the last year, we've been more aggressively than ever before collecting especially born digital uh, materials, such as harvesting the UK web domain, finally um, taking in e-books, e-journals, and adding that to our uh, digital audio, um, moving image, and digitized um, content collections that we've grown over the years. So that's fantastic, and I think for the first time we can look at this and say there's a substantial digital research collection that scholars can do something useful and interesting with. Um, but on the other hand, um, I think there's a long way to go. Um, I think that we do roughly the same thing that most of you do as well. I'm interested to know if that turns out not to be the case. So we treat our print material a lot like we treat our digital material, right? So what does that mean? That means you search on it in the catalog, most of the time using just metadata, um, not using, for instance, the full text or other properties of the digital objects. That means researchers search for it in the catalog, they select it, if it's print, they click on it, we carry it up for the basement. In the case of the British Library, it takes whatever, 90 minutes. If it's digital, they click on it, they'll get a copy on their desktop or their laptop. It will be a bit faster than coming up from the basement, but that's really the main difference. Um, and when you compare those two experiences, actually reading the print object is often much more enjoyable than reading the physical one on a funny screen. It's kind of small. You can't lay them out on your desk uh, in front of you. And I'd say that's, if I could put it this way, this isn't good enough. Um, we're not taking advantage of the affordances of the digital material, and that's something that we increasingly um, see uh, um, articulated in the research community. Here's sort of a, a typical kind of comment along the lines of one of the sorts of capabilities that are afforded by digital material. So a lone scholar can't read much less, much less make sense of millions of newspaper pages. But with digital techniques, of course, you can do analysis of millions of digital newspaper pages and learn some interesting things about it. Um, uh, at Stanford, Frank Amoretti makes a similar comment a bit more provocatively. Um, I don't know whether I fully buy into it, um, but he uh, makes statements like, uh, you know, reading individual works is as irrelevant as describing the architecture of a building from a single brick. Um, now, he's interested in a particular set of problems, um, but there's some real truth to uh, underlying that. Um, there are things that we can do when we treat our items as if they're uh, when we look at our digital collections as large-scale data sets, we can do analysis, we can do exploration, we can test hypotheses in ways that we can't do um, with, large, uh, with the, the physical and print collections. So um, many of us, I think, are in the space of responding to these changes in the nature of our collections and scholarship. So um, what are we doing about it? Uh, British Library, like uh, many of you, is doing lots of stuff. There's a lot of energy, a lot of activity. Um, one of the things we've done is we created a digital scholarship department, uh, which I lead. And within that department, there's a digital research team. Um, so what are some of the interesting properties of that team? It's cross-disciplinary. Uh, we've got uh, people with traditional curatorial background, um, library uh, uh, and information sciences background, um, digital humanities, and programming backgrounds. And I think it's actually quite essential 
today to have these sorts of multidisciplinary cross-skill teams uh, with the inclusion of technical resources directly in the team in order to make real and interesting progress. Um, and that team is charged with you know, supporting that innovative use of our digital collections. They explore how new technologies um, are shaping our research, research methods, and how that impacts the way the library does its business. Um, I'm not going to talk about two things today, but I just I thought I'd mention uh, at least one of them, which is uh, one of the important things they do is try to raise that skill and competency level across the library staff and we have an extensive internal digital scholarship training program which is addressing this challenge of we can't go out and hire in um, people who have that combination of skill sets. We have to take our existing staff um, on this interesting journey into the digital space. So I'm going to talk a bit about a specific uh, project, not the wide range of activities, um, and a specific service that has emerged of it and try to draw some conclusions from that uh, today. So um, part of the, the activities of the digital research team is the British Library Labs. Uh, this is funded in part, supported in part by the Andrew Mellon Foundation. Um, and the labs uh, is key to our doing that deep engagement with researchers. Okay? We need to bring researchers in, we need to sit down next to them, we need to see what they're doing, um, and we need to co-evolve methods and techniques and services with them. Um, I think in response to some of the, the previous uh, uh, speakers, the um, digital humanities, uh, digital scholars don't necessarily know quite what they want. They're evolving their methods, um, their methodologies, the tools and the services that they use. And we need to evolve those services together with them, or we'll end up with things that they don't need, and they'll up, end up uh, uh, with things that uh, won't work in a scalable fashion. So the core to the British Library Labs uh, is actually a competition. Um, we uh, um, challenge people to bring interesting ideas, what they could do with their digital content, if they could have you know, whatever access, whatever services they would need to do their work. They may not be the ones that we offer today. They're the ones that we might be offering tomorrow, the year after, or the year after. Now, uh, as an example, one of the winners of the 2013 competition um, is Peter Francois from uh, postdoc at Oxford. And uh, he helped us to better understand our digital collections in a way that uh, we hadn't uh, previously. So a lot of folks, I, 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 I love, uh, Peter, he had um, this wonderful application said, you know, this project will bring together my interest in 19th century European travel, statistical methods, and software development. And I thought, wow, that's, you know, that's the kind of guy we need. We need more of those. Um, and we need to see them. And they are emerging from the digital humanities programs that are in place today. Um, if I walk away from the microphone, we'll, you'll lose me, right? So I will stay here. Um, so, um, uh, so interesting thing to see on this, uh, um, on this chart here is this graph on, on the right. So you'll see a, a blue line um, sneaking up, up and to the right. That's a, a graph of just the numbers of objects in our collection, physical objects, um, uh, uh, counted per year. And you can see the explosion of print material during the 19th century. Uh, it ends up at 1890, uh, starts at about 1800. So um, you can contrast that with this red line down at the bottom. So we've done a lot of digitization at the British Library. We've done a lot. Millions, tens of millions of pages, hundreds of thousands. So a lot of digitization. That red line, that's the digitized uh, content um, uh, taken from that same period. And you'll note two important things about it. One, it's very low and down at the bottom. It's about 2% of that collection. Um, the second thing is that its distribution is totally different, okay? And so that's what Peter really drew our attention to. He says, I want to draw inferences from the digital collection. I want to test hypotheses and make conclusions that will be valid in the whole collection, okay? And what this tells us is that he can't just take some samples from the digital collection and draw appropriate conclusions. He has to have a richer method. He has to be able to draw representative samples. So that was what his project was. It was uh, he worked on us to create a, a, a tool to generate representative samples from the digital collection that would uh, match his other needs. So a beautiful example of that kind of close-in 
relationship with a researcher trying to apply new techniques for us um, to the digital collections and learning that there were some things that we deeply didn't understand about them. Um, and now we're working on taking that tool and making it sort of a production thing, something that can be used more widely by other researchers. Um, today's actually, so I, I was terrible at get, sending my slides in because I kind of, amongst other things, wanted to include the next slide. Um, so we've just closed our 2014 competition and um, we're announcing the winners this week. And so I thought I would just um, bring that along with me and be able to uh, uh, tell you about the winners of the 2014 British Library Lab competition um, today. We have two winners, um, one from uh, Australia and another from the UK. So I'd say it's the competition is uh, open globally. Most of the entries, in fact, come from the UK. Um, oh, and I see this box at the bottom should be something else that's displayed a little funny. So we had uh, um, two of them. One is um, uh, uh, from Desmond Schmidt and Anna Gerber at Queensland, and uh, they have a, a text image linking tool. So it's addressing this problem of transcriptions and linking transcriptions to the page images that they come from. So uh, um, if you create a transcription that's closely linked, it's just a huge amount of extra work. It's very time consuming and very fussy, um, and it doesn't work with transcriptions that have already been built. So they have some algorithms that will automatically match the lines in the transcription to the areas in the text on the page that correspond to it. Extremely useful, great tool for annotation, um, great kind of additional metadata about the relationship between the transcription and the original image. So um, I would love to see how we can integrate that into the British Library's digital collections and also extend it to make use of some of the open annotation uh, tools that have been developed over recent years. <clears throat> the second is um, uh, very different. Uh, title is Victorian Meme Machines by Bob Nicholson at Hill uh, at University. And he's looking at this question of what makes Victorian jokes funny or not funny. And uh, we're gonna do two things there. We're gonna extract a, um, a uh, a database of Victorian jokes from our newspaper and other content collections that will be useful for other scholars and for other purposes as well. Um, and we're going to integrate that with some quite uh, very modern feeling uh, sort of social networking evaluation techniques for deciding, you know, getting people to tell us what jokes still resonate and what don't by superimposing the jokes on images taken from a 19th century collection um, and posting them as memes if people are familiar with this concept um, uh, should be extremely entertaining. It's as uh, someone told me, characterized yesterday, is, is working with the grain of the web, not against it. It's leveraging those tools that are out there, the services, integrating those methods into digital research. Um, so that's uh, looking at bringing some of our large collections into the research uh, community. Another one's a little bit different, also a competition structure off the map. Um, we're working with a video game company, uh, CryEngine and Game City, that run a, a major um, a video game festival in the UK. Um, and we're giving packages of digital content from the British Library's collections to student uh, teams and undergraduate level who uh, compete to do, um, you know, sort of the best. Uh, um, 3D model uh, graphic fly through these sorts of things. Um, and I'll say last year, the um, quality of the results we saw was absolutely astounding. And the excitement that those uh, undergraduates had for the kind of material that are in our uh, historic collections also um, really astounding. This year, uh, we're doing it again. It has a Gothic theme um, to fit with the exhibition the British Library is running this fall, um, uh, Terror and Wonder, the Gothic Imagination. Um, so it's been a, a fantastic way to bring that content and those uh, ideas into a very different community and learn a tremendous amount from them. I'm supposed to stop right soon, I think, but I've had a few minutes. I get a few extra minutes. Excellent. Um, last thing I wanted to talk about was um, uh, another piece of work we've done in taking the um, a large-scale uh, digitization piece and putting it into the public domain where people can work with it effectively. So a few years ago, we digitized with Microsoft about 65,000 out-of-copyright books. Um, was at the time a very large-scale digitization project, fantastic. Um, and we put it uh, online. You could 
search for books in the catalog and click on them and you could find them. And the level of use of that material in the hundreds, I don't know what the number is, but rel Mandy might know the exact number, uh, relatively low levels of usage of this um, uh, material, partly because we chose it because it wasn't in the well-known canon, the, the works that are commonly uh, used and, and read today. So great idea resulted in less impact in many ways than we might have uh, desired. Um, but that material is in the public domain. We can do anything we want to with it. So, so last year we did. Um, we've had over the last few years folks coming to us and saying, gee, we're interested in the images. Can you get the images out of those books? We'd like to work with them. And at first we thought, wow, this is a really hard problem. No idea how to do it. Um, it turned out uh, we had already done it and we just didn't realize it um, <laughs> as a side effect of the optical character recognition process. Um, you know, where the text isn't, that's where the images are. Um, it pulls them out and, and you can identify them easily in the OCR output. So we were able to, in fact, once we figured it out, uh, quite easily extract all of the images from all of the pages from 65,000 books. Um, and uh, we said, oh, what are we going to do with them? That's about, it's about a million images, a little bit more than a million images. And we thought, okay, we'll just put them on Flickr. Right? So why Flickr, right? So Flickr is a place where people go to look at images. They don't come to the British Library um, that often. We do have an images gallery thing, which is fantastic, but, um, and people use it, but not at the scale that we imagine there might be interest um, in, in this uh, material. Um, and uh, having done that, we were really pleased by the level of excitement and interest. It was, it was in popular science, right? Um, it was all over the web. It was in uh, mainstream uh, magazines, newspapers with our extensive advertising campaign, uh, which comprised one tweet and one blog post. <laughs> okay? Um, um, so um, I, I will ask a question now. Sorry for flicking the, the slides. Um, does uh, anyone want to hazard a guess who doesn't already know the answer to this question? How many image views have we gotten? This launched last December mid-December, so in the last, whatever that is, six months. How many image views? Five you cheated. Oh, uh, no, I didn't. Oh, okay, guess. Uh, <laughs> how many? Five million. Five million, five million. Great guess. Any other? <laughs> other guesses? That's a pretty high number. It is. Um, 19th century material. Um, so, um, almost, uh, I told you, the, the May number already. Remember the first slide? What number did I tell you to remember? 150 million. 150 million image views. Actually, it, it's 160 million uh, at the moment. So um, that's, that was quite surprising, right? So this is a bunch of 19th century material that no one's looked at. So this is the, the way I, I like to remember it or think about it is that um, before we did this, basically nobody alive had looked at any of those pictures. Yeah. And today, millions of people have looked collectively at all of them, um, which is, from the point of view of a library, quite an interesting thing. Right? Um, it's part of our job. Um, uh, and I'm just going to skip ahead. So we've seen them also picked up in lots of ways, right? So the question is, so people looked at them, so what? So there's been creative use. Uh, anyone know the Burning Man Festival? Um, so there's going to be some huge display at the Burning Man. This is a, 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 a mural or collage. It's, you know, 10 feet tall and 20 feet long or something like that um, that somebody picked up. Nothing to do with us. We did hear about it. Beautiful. Um, it's being picked up in research. Uh, people, uh, researchers are people too, as I say. Um, and researchers <laughs> saw this and said, wow, you know, I could be using that in my research. Um, including both small-scale and large-scale collaborative projects. Um, the Lost Visions at Cardiff is a major uh, HRC-funded project, and this is the center, uh, really the centerpiece of that is that collection. We've seen um, some interesting crowdsource apps, talk about metadata, metadata games, what could be more fun? I'm sure they'll make a million, a million, um, but it might be more fun than that. We've seen it a lot on Wikipedia. Uh, we've seen tutorials. We've seen... Um, uh, sound material inspired by it. We've seen uh, uh, a lot of tagging, which I'm going to rush past, but um, we've, someone has tagged under 3,000. They've tagged about 3,000 maps in that collection. Um, and so those are maps we never knew were there. They were embedded in the, in the books. 
um, now we've got that little bit of metadata about them, we can georeference them and find out the, uh, we have some nice crowdsourced georeferencing techniques um, that will provide a geographical index through the maps to that collection. Should be fun. Um, use in open uh, courseware, of course, um, and art therapy courses, um, and commercial settings as well. Um, and that's, this is, I'm sorry, I've, I've, this is an old version of this slide. Um, uh, um, in commercial settings as well, and we're working at the moment with um, the Technology Strategy Board in the UK to try to figure out ways to track the commercial and other impact of releasing this kind of content into the wild. Um, so I'm wrapping up. Um, so um, that's, I think, all, all I really uh, needed to say. And I think there's some interesting discussions to be had around things like, um, uh, can we do this more? Um, uh, can other libraries and organizations sort of relax um, take the, the chance of putting their content into the public domain like that, where the kind of usage we see with it outstrips by orders of magnitude, even quite generous um, uh, estimates of what the use might possibly be. Um, uh, I think there's some real opportunities there. There are also some interesting questions about silos and some really interesting questions of data versus metadata. Amount of metadata for those images? Zero, right? Zero. Um, only thing was inherited from the information we had about the books, um, but that didn't stop people from using it. So, you know, so let's try to get our digital content out there. Let's not stand in the way um, in the, the space between researchers and the content they're trying to get to.